Hello and uh, welcome to our studio audience today as well as to those who are watching uh, online. My name's uh, Jennifer Hewitt and I'm here to facilitate the discussion with our three panellists on the topic of why big business needs to lead on work, health and safety. Before we start, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people and to pay our respects to Elders both past and present. The other issue I'd like to talk about initially is that the 28th of April is World Day for Safety and Health at Work and Workers Memorial Day. That's a day when we honour those who've died at work and think about how our actions can prevent future work-related uh, incidents, deaths and illnesses. We're going to talk about this today, in particular we're going to explore the role that big business has in taking the lead on workplace safety, uh, health and, and health. Uh, so I think we should start with some of the research which I think is uh, extraordinarily telling. Um, Safe Work Australia has estimated that the total cost for work-related injury is nearly $62 billion dollars. That equates to a cost of over $116,000 per workplace injury or illness. What we also know is that when a worker experiences an injury that takes them out of the workplace for a week or more, either productivity decreases or overtime has to be paid to others. Workers who experience an additional workload become fatigued and are more at risk, obviously, of injury themselves. Workers' compensation premiums go up and there are medical costs and rehabilitation costs as well. There's also obviously the possibility of legal fees, fines and penalties for the organisation um, if the work and healthy, health and safety laws have been breached and of course the reputational damage that can result. There are also other flow-on costs, kind of more indirect. We know about them, the staff turnover, the retraining, the loss of corporate knowledge and, the, and of course the loss of reputation. And that does affect uh, profit margins and the bottom line. Safe Work Australia's research also shows us that taking work, work health and safety seriously offers many big benefits to big business. Most obviously, that's avoiding the direct costs of the injuries. Uh, but it's also that investors look also for information about how businesses look after the safety of their workers. They look for companies who manage risk well because they're more likely to have a more productive and more engaged workforce. And of course, they're less likely to suffer the costs of any safety failure. So what we're going to do today is have this discussion with our three um, panellists and, and get their insights in how they think big business can take the lead, should take the lead, is taking the lead into these, these types of issues. So on my immediate left, uh, we have Diane Smith-Gander. She is Safe Work Australia's chair, and she's also chair of the Asbestos and Eradication Council. She holds non-executive director roles for AGL Energy and West Farmers, and is a board member of Keystart Loans, Henry Davis York, and the Committee for the Economic Development of Australia. Then there's Dean Pritchard, Dean is a non-executive di director for Broad Spectrum. He's occupied roles as chair and non-executive director across a range of industries. He also has an extensive career in the building construction industry as an engineer and CEO. And he holds a particular interest in the area of corporate social responsibility. And finally, uh, Marcus Hook uh, is the executive general manager for production and logistics at News Corp. He's had more than 20 years of experience in operational leadership and has a lot of knowledge driving work health and safety for improving operational outcomes. He's worked locally and internationally with a range of businesses, including Colgate, Palmolive and News Corp Australia. So I am Jennifer Hewitt. I work for the uh, Australian Financial Review and I've long had an interest in uh, the intersection of big business and policy and I'm particularly fascinated by the, the evolving nature of the, the um, pressures on big business in particular, including things like work safety and health, and how they are key, uh, integral to the broader culture of the organisation. So Diane, I'd, I'd like to start by asking you, now, when you're sitting on top of, of a very big organisation, either as a, you know, as a board or even senior management, and, and you can be operating in a range of industries, sometimes uh, across different countries, many different types of sites, how do you drive the standard safety culture and the understanding of those issues right through the organisation? Yeah, thanks, Jen. 
Look, I think anyone who thinks that's an easy task is completely underestimating the size of the challenge. It's not something that's easy at all. Uh, and I think anyone that thinks that you can sit at the top of the organisation and give out a set of edicts and then it will naturally just flow through is also really kidding themselves. So the first thing is, how do you build a culture in your organisation that allows everyone through the organisation to be a safety leader? Because without that vigilance through the organisation, you're not going to get the outcomes you're seeking. Um, we live in a very complex world um, and we can't overcomplicate it. So you used a very important word when you said standard, because I think having standardisation through your systems, safety designed in, and then standard outcomes that you're seeking is a very important part of this. And so when you're dealing with a distributed organisation, as you said, perhaps across um, national boundaries as well, you need to make sure that you don't get cute and start to bend the rules oh, it's a bit different in India, or Western Australia's got some particular challenges, therefore we need to do things differently. When you start to um, put shades of grey in, it's very hard for people to interpret what it is you're looking for. So I think the use of all of your staff as safety leaders, and then the importance of standardisation are the two most important things in that setting. Now, Dean, of course, we always hear, though, about the need for business to be more flexible. Uh, Diane saying e exactly the opposite when it comes to safety. Do you agree with that? Uh, I don't think we're saying it's uh, the opposite. I think the, the real issue is to take the best parts of your uh, organisation, the performing parts, to set the standards and then try to get the rest of the organisation to perform in that way. And that's where it's you know, pretty tough, uh, pretty hard to do. And culture is a pretty important part of it. Uh, but uh, as well, that strategy, I mean, two things have to work together. We need both strategy and, and, and culture. And getting the strategy right and the understanding of this is what we are doing, these are the initiatives we are taking, this is how safety links, links into that. I think it's pretty important, but flexibility is, may, is to me the opportunity for change, and that's important because uh, there will be, as Diane said, different parts of the organisation performing to different levels in the safety area. Uh, and, and Marcus, on that point, of course, you, I mean, you work at News Corp, you, you, so you're covering a range of sites. Yep. Uh, and, and you'd think uh, that many of the issues that would affect, uh, say, the production of newspapers is very different than those that would affect newspa uh, journalists, for example, kind of providing that content. So how do you uh, accommodate those types of differences and yet maintain a safety culture? It's a framework you put in place. Um, so you, everything becomes a risk-based conversation. So the, the risk you're exposed to at a, at a print site might be moving equipment, whereas the risk you, you, you face with a journalist might be a, a war zone or a, a, um, a bikey that might want to attack you if, you if you're taking a photo of them outside the court. So it's being aware of the environment you're confronting and having a plan in place to, to deal with it. Um, to the point about flexibility, I think they're, they're, the standards I agree with, you've got to have, have some strict standards on some things, but that doesn't um, disable flexibility. Flexibility comes in some of the operational improvements you can make in an environment. Um, whereas if you want to control and have a safe environment, then you need to have standards in place there for people to abide by. And that's hard enough, uh, I, I would imagine, in, in a big organisation to kind of drive that right through. Um, every element of your, and, and creating those, those safety leaders. Uh, but you're also not just dealing with your own organisation, uh, you're dealing with the whole, the use of, of uh, contractors, subcontractors, really many small businesses, many of whom I would imagine would argue that, uh, that what's appropriate in a big business is not really appropriate for them. So how do big businesses encourage that same attention to safety and the same types of procedures and processes? This is an area that I think there's been quite a lot of change, you know, over the period that I've been a non-executive director, so the last sort of 10 to 15 years, um, because we've had a lot more conversation in the corporate social responsibility space about things like ethical sourcing and your supply chain. And 
We know that um, in Australia we have a very deeply layered contracting environment. You know, we work together at Broad Spectrum, and you would be the head contractor, but then you know you would be subcontracting down. And we're a, a very um, large nation, and we like to see activity in the regions. Um, and when you get out to regional Australia, much smaller companies, but they're sort of connected back to the large entity. So again. You can't say because it's a subcontractor, it's not my problem. Clearly, legally, you're not allowed to do that, but ethically, you wouldn't do that either. Um, and so it requires a real understanding of what your supply chain looks like, what is the ecosystem in which your company is operating. Because you know you're going to get a range of outcomes, you're going to be measuring those outcomes. You want to be able to get a line of sight through the contractors as well. So that's the first thing, is ensuring that you do understand what's going on and you're actually measuring it. And if you, uh, it, take, it can, takes us back to the, um, you know, to our uh, focus, I guess, and that is big business leading. Uh, I think this is a, a really practical example and the really good thing about the way in which uh, big business is dealing with its subcontractor um, marketplace. And you said encourage, uh, encourage s some of the smaller players to, to build their practices and improve their practices. Uh, it's an absolute requirement if you're going to do business with the, the leading companies that um, subcontractors and suppliers fit in with the, uh, the appropriate uh, standards of you know, pre-qualification, um, uh, induction, auditing, and even though they may well find that pretty frustrating and annoying and uh, um, seems very bureaucratic to some, uh, in the end they come to realise that uh, they make more money that way and for both parties that's an important thing but it's a very important role and I, I see a lot of companies really seeing this as an essential part of uh, a partnership more so than just a, a contractual relationship and long term being rather than short term. Mm. Well, well uh, Dean, Dean was saying that uh, to some people it might seem bureaucratic, but also I would imagine to some small groups, um, it not only seems bureaucratic, it also seems something that they cannot afford uh, in terms of expertise, uh, time and resources because they don't have all those layers uh, to draw on. So how, do, how does big business say to them, I'm sorry that this is really important, and how does sometimes the boards have to make a judgment of what's appropriate or not? I think as Dean was saying, it's the rules of engagement. Uh, and probably a good example is we've got a fleet of vehicles that do a million kilometres a week um, delivering our papers around the country. And whether that's toll or Australia Post vehicles or a mum and dad um, driving a van, we've got a, a kick the tyre program where we'll check, make sure that the, you know, the lights work, that the, the tyres aren't bald, and there's a common standard across everyone. And if anyone wants to deliver our papers, they've got to meet that standard. So they know that they, you know, when they come to work for us, um, they're playing by our rules. So it's it's an expectation now. It's just accepted. Mm. So Diane, you were talking about regional Australia. Do, do you think that means that by necessity some of those businesses just can't? Do they actually learn to adjust, or or do the ones that that don't learn to adjust uh, inevitably uh, get cut cut themselves off? Well, I mean, certainly there are many examples of, you know, smaller contractors that companies aren't able to continue to work with because they fail to meet the safety standards. Um, but I, I think there are plenty of resources available for smaller companies. You know, as Dean said, big business will encourage, mm -hmm. you know, and be helpful and reach out. Uh, and I think just the... Um, rub off effect of some of the resources that are available within large business. The government does a huge amount, you know, through safe work and the regulators in the various jurisdictions, there's an absolute wealth of resources available, um, you know, on many levels for people to be able to understand what they might be able to do to improve their safety system, what sorts of things they need to measure, you know, how to build those systems into their business. So I don't think it's inevitable that you have to have a business of certain size to be able to work with big business, um, but you certainly have to have safety standards that are at a certain level. Yeah. Yeah. I, did, I think the, the other um, role big business plays is to play the coach. Mm -hmm. So as a small business, you don't quite know what your obligations are, um, but as, as a large entity, um, you're, you're well versed, you're well versed, you've got more resources to look into it. So you know, we can set the expectation that you, you know, we want to see this policy, we want to see this standard, we want to see this practice. So 
the, the small business doesn't necessarily, necessarily have to have that in their team. Mm. They can then utilise you know, big business and their resources to, to help um, define what they need to have in place. Mm. And a good tendering process and a good co contracting process from a large business to a small bi business will cover all those sorts of things. Yeah. So I think sometimes, you know, we get a bit too excited about the legalese of our contracts and, you know, what is the intent of what we're actually trying to do. But you can certainly see some very good ones that address a number of these matters. So, Dean, do you, th do you think that business, big business has become uh, more skilled at actually providing that education, that resource yeah. for small businesses over the years? By necessity, yes, because that's where the where the benefits come. So, um, and part of the uh, this the uh, purchasing skill is really to determine who are the people that we are best able to invest in, because the com the big businesses are investing a lot for in the, in this area uh, for their own for their own benefit. Uh, but it's, um, it's it, you need to be sure that you're putting your effort in the right place if you can. And how can you be sure that you're putting your effort in the right place? I mean, how do you measure that type of thing? Yeah. Uh, well, if you, I guess if you start, um, you've got a lot of data. Uh, you've got a lot of statistical data, uh, incidents, costs of incidents, you know, the, the various uh, frequency rates uh, and so on. Uh, and if you think about it from a, if you start from the board's perspective, they will be thinking, uh, what's happening? What are the trends? What's uh, what's going on? This might be a long answer, if that's all no, right. No, no, that's uh, fine. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so um, and so, data is an important part of it, uh, but the more important part of it is getting getting out there and really trying to understand uh, what is happening in the business. And I'm particularly uh, focused on in being part of boards that where boards are very close to the action in the best way that they can, that's always difficult, but who spend time out in the businesses, out at, out at the facilities, uh, meeting with people, verifying that what is being said about the culture, uh, that it's, they th each board member has the responsibility of being satisfied that it is really happening and what people are telling them is, is happening in the field. And you have to get out there and you have to become skilled uh, as board members to be able to ask the right questions, to know what a, an HBI is, um, high potential incident, uh, to know what that means, to challenge managers as to whether they really understand that and what they think about their businesses. It's, it's a very, um, an, it's a long answer because it's a big process. Uh, I think. So all of those things have to come together. Mark has used the risk word before, you know, and at core, if you don't understand the risks in the business and you don't have a good risk appetite statement, you're not going to know whether you're focusing in the right area, you know, and then to the associated question of spending money. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting line that you walk in trying to not run a cost benefit on safety. Because if you think about that, you know, to its end um, incarnation, a cost benefit on safety is a sort of nonsense. You've got a safety standard, you've got to deliver that. Um, you, you can't attach, you can attach costs to incidents, as Dean has rightly said, but the notion of a cost benefit for safety outcomes just is, I think, anathema, you know, to most thinking boards. So how do you then ensure that you are investing enough in your safety function and that the way the whole system in your organisation runs, because everything you do is an investment in safety. Um, so I'm probably interested in what these guys think about that particular question, because it, it does come up a lot. Okay, it's, it's, it's funny, because when we're listening to that, that opening blurb around the, the cost of injuries, yes. um, I, to me, that's not the conversation. Because um, when, my, my view is you look at uh, safety is, is hard to lead, but it's the most important thing to lead and everything else flows after that. So if you're trying to build a culture or an environment in a workplace, you start with safety, then you focus on your people, then your efficiencies and your, your costs flow through. Um, if you can't lead safety, then you actually can't lead a business. Um, you, you can't lead for efficient production, you can't lead for quality production. So when we get safety wrong, everything else goes wrong. Um, you've got a distracted workforce, who will more likely have quality issues, more likely have um, breakdowns, downtimes, inefficient outcomes, um, which are really hard to measure in those strict costs. So 
getting safety right up the front actually leads to some really good outcomes that flow through. So the dollar analysis, I agree. I mean, I, I don't do safety because I'm worried about the cost of workers' comp or the cost of a potential fine against me. I do safety because it leads through every other aspect of the business which delivers results. Yeah, so knowing my financial outcomes are going to be better if yep. the place is safer. Yep. Yeah. You, t you take a business like Broad Spectrum with a lot of a big range of operations, various sites doing different things and not all of them performing uh, at the same level. There's a very strong correlation between strong safety performance and, and uh, profitable business. Uh, and it's, it, you know, the planning's better, the organisation's better, the culture's better, people are committed, uh, they turn up every day, they love being at work, uh, it, and they go home at night safe. It's, it all goes together. I, I guess, Marcus, it also depends how broadly you define safety. I mean, I suppose in some ways it's easy to think of safety when you talk about, you know, no, you know, no particular um, injuries at work uh, and to measure it like that, but you seem to be talking about safety in a much broader Way. Well, it is. I mean, if you've got the you've got the physical well-being, you've got the the, the um, mental well-being, and you've got the general well-being. And I, I think there's a, a journey you want to take all that all our people on. Now, whether it's they're coming to work in a in a fit and mentally prepared way, um, uh, it leads down to healthy eating and and and, and exercise. Um, so it's it, if someone arrives at work in, in a healthy condition, then you're going to get a better outcome as well. So part of what I see we need to do is educate people on on general preparedness for work, and it is the and it's a, it's a much bigger topic now. I think it's, it's getting a better understanding of the whole mental health issue and, and you know, what, what are the lookouts for that? Because it's very easy to see if someone's broken a leg or it's very easy to see if someone's you know, you know, cut a hand. But the triggers for mental health is something that I think we're still learning as a, a, um, as a society and how we deal with that because there's, there's a lot more stigmas associated with that. So I think there's, there's a lot for us to get right in that field still. Well, Diane, you said that you know, you, you can't treat safety as a, a cost-benefit equation. I suppose I understand that, but if you start talking about fitness for work, prepare, mental health, preparedness, you get into very um, uh, much more fuzzy areas, I think, of, of measurement, and you also slight, you might get start to get this idea of how long is a piece of string. I mean... Yeah, it's, it's a so very, good, very good point. Um, but I don't think it's one that we can step away from. You know, this is difficult and it's the current sort of new frontier in, in some ways. But I think in Australia, we do a pretty good job of measuring these types of things. And we have some good line of sight, the work that's been done around bullying, some of the things that's been done on domestic violence, they play into this as well. Um, and we've done some really good research and built some very good resources for organisations. You know, for example, there's a uh, the People at Work project, which has um, a really good benchmark survey which you can download it's all free you find it on the safe work website um, and on regulated websites that allow you to sort of run a test through your organization to see what the stresses are in individual work roles and so forth um, and so i think we just need to recognize that we've still got a number of steps to go uh, but that we do have resources available in the area and it is still a difficult conversation to have with people you know because this is very personal stuff you know it's, talking to someone last night who leads a business that's in food service. So they have a lot of people who are very passionate about food. And for some of those people, that translates into some weight problems. I mean, how do you have that conversation with people across a business um, without it stepping into the personal and becoming inappropriate? And, and I think the senior management and the board have to provide the settings for leaders throughout the organisation to understand how to have those sorts of courageous conversations, if you will, with people um, that are going to step into these psychosocial areas. Well, uh, sorry, can I just add that? Yeah. Diane, one, one way to help is to create a framework where that's what everybody talks about. Uh, and, you know, the companies that invest, uh, I'm thinking of mine sites, when a change of shift at five in the morning or whenever, um, the first 15 minutes is spent with a physio and with some exercise. So it becomes commonplace to talk about uh, fitness for work and health. And so it, it, that improves the framework for being able to have those difficult conversations, I think. So it, that it ev ev everybody thinks about it and my mates are thinking about mm -hmm. it and talking about it and how fit am I and boy, you haven't, you're struggling today. Uh, do, you, do you think that runs ever runs the risk though of, of people seeing that as too intrusive on their own personal space, on their own privacy issues, and how do you deal with that? I think it's what you as an organisation choose to give your people permission to talk about. 
You know, we talk about this a lot in the gender diversity space. You know, um, people have families, they have children, um, they have aging parents, all of these caring responsibilities. If you don't talk about that openly in the workplace, it makes people feel there's some sort of hidden agenda. Oh, I better not talk about the fact that I'm thinking about having children. Maybe, you know, they won't think I'm career minded or whatever. So if we don't open the door on being able to talk about these things in a sensible way, um, people are going to think it's not the fodder of the organisation. So I think there is something about giving permission about what you will talk about. I think it links back to exactly what we're here to talk about today is it, that is the conversation that needs to occur. Um, how you how you live outside work impacts how, how you work. Um, and if, if you're not coming to work in a, in a fit and healthy condition, particularly if, if you've got a, a, um, a job which requires physical activity, then you're putting yourself at greater risk. And for us to, to not confront that conversation means we're, you know, we're neglecting our duty. So I think the role we've got to play is to start those conversations with people to say, look, look I don't believe you've, you know, what, the way you're presenting is, is not necessarily um, you know, suitable for the, the job you're, you're seeking to do today. Um, and it is the next frontier of the conversations we need to have. And, and how effectively, Marcus, do you think big businesses have been tackling that, that new frontier so far? Uh, mixed. Um, I, I agree with um, Dean. I was down in, in Tassie recently um, at Simplot um, at their, um, their fruit or their, their, their veggie factory down there. And they start every team meeting with a, a 15 minute um, bend and stretch. So they talk about what they're going to do for the day and before they walk out, everyone stretches. And it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a tick and flick exercise. Everyone was generally engaged in, in, in that program. Um, yeah, there are good stories of the mining sites doing it. We've launched in news a few of our areas doing um, an industrial athlete. Um, and so we've got um, you know, 40 plus year old um, printers who you know, you'd think would you know, mock this sort of thing, um, doing a bit of a bend and stretch before they, before they start work. So it's, it evolves, um, but it starts with that risk-based conversation where if you've got the aging workforce, how do you, how do you balance that? Uh, but, but Dean, do you, do you think that it, at some level boards have also got to say, well, yes, this is a journey, we're all kind of constantly improving, this is evolving, but there is a limit to the amount of company resources that should be devoted to this area? Uh, there's always a limit, um, but I'm, in my experience, that's, that's not really been the issue. Uh, in terms of the resources because I mean line managers are the key to this um, and um, there are probably some safety professionals here but and they will truly understand the 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 view that um, line management has to perform in in this area uh, and that's that's an appropriate way for us to be you know putting our effort so we the line managers are there we just want them to do this work better uh, so it's not necessarily a question of the board thinking we're not spending enough in this area. That's not, not ever been an issue in, in my experience. Okay. It's oh. just how, how well people are doing it. The, 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 the big thing, I mean, the, it, the issue for boards is it's not what they think, what they do. And it's, and it's exactly the same thing when you get into safety. It's not what people say about safety and what we believe and what our principles and things are. It's how we do it. Uh, and um, you know that that doesn't cost any more money to do that. And and how behavior. how do you avoid um, that? There there can be a certain element of, of, of ticker box compliance. H how do you make sure that is not what is happening? Well, you know, I think what Dean said it's what you do. And if there had to be a, a sort of test in the boardroom to see whether people might pass or fail. Um, on the way they think about safety. For me, it would be how well they are able to express that risk appetite statement. You know, are they really, have they put the time in to truly understand what's going on in the business, the external influences that are on the business, and therefore, um, what are the true risks that need to be mitigated? And how is the business operating to do that? Um, and if a board is able to express that very clearly, you know that they're going to steward the organisation towards the right activities to, to mitigate the risks. And there won't be a cost conversation in there because this is the way we want to operate our business. Um, and so at, at the end of the day, for me, that's the job of the director when it comes to this matter is to be, you know, have taken the activities to inform yourself well enough to be able to express a proper opinion on the risk appetite statement. 
I, I was struck by Dean talking in a sense about walk around management um, by, uh, by going out and finding out exactly, chatting to people, talking about what's going on. And yet this is in an era where we've got far more um, automation, uh, evolved and sophisticated technology. So it's that mix. How, how do you get that mix right? Marcus. You've got to touch the organisation. So Dean's exactly right. You, you can't, you can't run, you can't check the business on a Google Hangout or or a video conference. You've, you've got to get out there, talk to people, ask them the question: what's working for them, what's not. Um, ask them uh, again. You know, the, those frontline leaders are the key to success and failure. If those frontline leaders, if you if your frontline leaders in an organisation know what they've got to do to deliver success, then you're going to be successful. So you've got to test them in the roles they're doing and test the people that report to them. Um, and, and make sure that they're getting the support they need. Mm. So we've got a, a program which is safety leadership walks. And it's, uh, most of our executives do two a year. Safety leadership, leadership walks. walks. And you just walk out, you talk to someone on the floor, ask them what's working, what's not. Um, when we first kicked it off, I think people were a bit sort of stum, you know. <laughs> Am I getting in trouble if I give you my real point of view on this? But there, you get some quite frank conversations. Um, and then you deal with those issues and people realise that, okay, safety is, is a serious consideration for the business. So it's very simple to get the message and very simple to test the business on, on what's working and what's not. And the insights can be super meaningful. Um, I did a, a safety walk when I was on the NBN Co board and I went to a construction site in suburban Perth and it was a really hot day. Um, and so I was going out to interact with the supervisor and a couple of the construction guys and I thought I would be probably hearing about the heat and you know issues like that. When I arrived, they were sitting under a tree and I thought, well, that's great. I'm glad they're under the tree. Uh, <laughs> are you in shade? But I'd be even happier if they were doing some work. So we had a bit of a chat, you know, um, and I sort of wanted to know why we're under the tree. And it turned out that when the design drawings had turned up and they'd scoped the work and got ready to go, they turned out to be wrong. The first premise they went to, it wasn't right. Um, and so they had to go and sit under the tree to wait. And I asked the supervisor what he thought was the biggest hazard they actually faced as part of this conversation. And he said to me, well, this bad design is the biggest hazard I face because I get my crew here, we go through the, our um, safe work methods, we're all ready to go, and then all of a sudden we have to stop and sit under a tree. And then I've got to get them back up again, mm -hmm. ready to think about doing the job safely. And if I have to do that, two or three times a day said, I know that by the time I get to the third time, I have got zero chance. We might as well go home because something is actually going to go wrong. And the insight in that conversation for me, because I go, okay, right, let's go back through the contract to chain what was actually causing that. So these are the sorts of insights you get when you go and ask very simple questions out in the field. It works both ways though, of course, yes. because you're out there as a board member uh, and you're displaying the culture of the organisation from the top. And uh, this is a really, you know, a, a really important part for board education, training, uh, broad spectrum. We got, uh, we have, we have leader-led safety conversations is the terminology for the same sort of uh, conversations with people about safety. So we sent each board member out with our chief safety person who was obviously very good at that uh, as a way of coaching and developing the skills because not oh, everybody the has skills the, of the board, of the board, the board members right. yes because mm -hmm. not everybody has the same the same level of skill and experience they come that's the whole idea of a board to have a different perspective so that was uh, very useful and and helps when you've got a board that's going to be out there four or five times a year on sites um, meeting with people and they will be and, and you're terribly on show in that uh, circumstance. You, you walk up uh, the stairs without holding onto the handrail and the people you've been trying to talk safety to are saying, well, hang on, what's going on here? You know, and, and some board members just think it's, you know, not serious. You really, that's really critical that we get those, that, those common standards and, and, you know, I'm really uh, determined, I think, that boards really take on this responsibility and both uh, checking and validating, but demonstrating the culture of the place but with their own skills. Or, or the worst thing is someone makes a suggestion in response to how could you make the place safe or whatever, and some bright spark says, wow, what would that cost? 
No, that's the one you're told you never go to that question because it's not relevant in that setting. Yeah. So you do have to be really careful about what comes out of your mouth. Uh, and to, to Dean's point, Marcus, about um, you know demonstrating whether even walking down a staircase holding onto the rail, or, to what extent is this uh, a, a, a show of solidarity, almost a symbolic gesture, and how, how much is it you know, really integral to, to the company's performance, do you think? It's, it's going to come back to, well, it's, it's all the risk space. So you, you put in um, safeguards around risks you've identified. And if you've identified something's a risk, be it you know, holding the hand as you walk up and down, then, then that's the, the standard you live by. Um, so if you've identified a standard you're going to have, then, then everyone buys up to it. Um, you, you can't have standards that apply to some and not to others, because at what point do you say, um, this, this rule's for me and it's not for you? So if, if, we're, if a company's going to be serious about something, then everyone signs up to it. Um, and it, it, it always needs to be the right thing. Um, and we've got to be careful around when we put the rules in place or we, we make the design right. It's got to be the easy thing to do, because if, if we make it the hard thing to do, then human nature is to circumvent and, and, and find the easiest path. So the challenge, I think, for, for business is, is to design safety as the easy outcome and design safety as the right outcome, and that so then becomes a natural outcome. I think there is a risk we can overburden it if we, if we make it too cumbersome. But if holding the handrails is something simple to do and it's something really easy to lead by. Yeah. Um, well, that's right. I, I mean, making something simple to do sounds great, um, but I think we've all come across circumstances where in organisations uh, it's become not exactly a bureaucratic monster, but certainly, you know, a lot of what seem to be reasonably redundant overlays uh, and, uh, and, and repetitions. How do you avoid that type of issue and how significant an issue is it? Or do you think that's just one of those, the, in that sense, the costs of doing safety business properly? I, I haven't seen an organisation that doesn't, uh, hasn't got the benefit from constantly reviewing the way it does things just finding a better way of doing it, an easier way, a simpler way. Uh, generally, it's best designed from the people closest to the action. Um, and, but that kind of ongoing, that needs to be part of the, the, the DNA of the organisation, that they are constantly changing, they're looking for improvements, and that means all of the process uh, are up, up for grabs. Once they're agreed, then it, that's the way that uh, we should do it. But, but from time to time, there has to be that systematic uh, review. And I think we're on the cusp of, you know, a lot of technology and automation improvements in this area. I was at one of AGL's plants just recently, and there's a system there now when you do a safety walk, you see a hazard, you see something that looks like it needs a bit of maintenance, you know, there's the photo and it's straight through the app. So you're not finding the issue of, um, multiple observations of the same mm -hmm. issue in a, in a plant as people move around it and so forth. <clears throat> but I think people are finding it a bit harder to make the investments at the back end of the process where there's still a lot of paper and a, you know, a lot of reports that are you know, a bit dense and hard to get onto. So I'm looking forward to some automation in that sphere soon. Mm -hmm. I think a good example to, to explain what I mean <coughs> is um, the safe work method statements was, was, was mentioned before. And when you look at one of our areas in the business, we had a pile this high um, that we expected people to understand to be able to do their job safely and we'd written in the same bit of information into about 100 documents and then people would have an injury and we'd say well it was written down in the document you know Why didn't how'd you, you get injured <laughs> so we revised and we took about one one and a half thousand safe work statements from around the country and, and diluted it down to 10 so there's now 10 common standards that we expect everyone around the country to know um, rather than one and a half thousand so we built a system that that was um, technically safe but impractical so mm -hmm. yeah, we, we took that feedback and you know, to Dean's point, how, how do you simplify it and make it a practical beast? And, and you know, 10 is quite an easy one for people to know. So it's, we made a system that in reality you couldn't expect anyone to follow because it was just it was too overburdened. And so we had to come around and improve it. And that's, that's the challenge we've got to work to is how do we look at what we've got and make it the easy thing to do and the right thing to do? And Jenny, it goes back, you mentioned flexibility back, back earlier. Uh, in uh, in this situation, what we're doing is, is also, and it's pretty consistent across, across a lot of businesses, I think becoming less prescriptive and, and really, and so the procedures, instead of describing exactly how everything is to be done, sets the standards. The standards can be clearly understood. And then there's a greater degree of flexibility for, for the different places where there are different climates, risks, 
cultures of being able to deliver that. But the, there are certain immutable standards that we so just have. these principles-based safety. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 that's, and that does help to make things much clearer, but also helps us decide what's a given and where can I have flexibility? And that's where with the creativity and innovation and change and improvement can come in that flexibility bit. So long as you get this, the standards absolutely clear. Mm. Yep. And, and obviously technology is making a big difference uh, in yeah. this area. Is it always a force for, for good in, in, that, in that sense of making people understand it more, things more easily or being able to check things more easily? Obviously we've seen some examples uh, with, with the use of vehicles as you were talking yep. about. Where do you, how do you see that evolving? I mean, vehicles is, is, is a great example. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest risks we've got in a lot of workplaces is moving vehicles around people. Um, and, and we were talking about this before, which was, you know, I might work in a newspaper environment, someone else might work in a mining environment, but they're still moving equipment and people. And so what practices can you put in place? And there's good technology advances in that area where um, you know, the, the vehicles will stop itself if it goes in the wrong area or if it has a as it, um, it hits something at a certain speed, it'll stop itself. So technology to me is an enabler to improve. Um, it's an enabler to provide the information to make better decisions. Um, it, it provides information through to you so you, you, know, you can be more educated on what's occurring out in the, out in the field. Um, so they're, they're, it's only going to help us going forward. Another example would be uh, the use of drones, yeah, mm. the amazing use of drones to reduce the, the working at height inspection of simple example of gutters on high level gutters on buildings, being able to inspect uh, without having to get people up there. Uh, there are lots of ways in which people are finding really clever things to do that take away the hazards that we've uh, been used to and therefore change the, 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 the process. So, so big business is, uh, is always, uh, you know, evolving its processes, uh, learning a lot and that, but also big business is often acquiring other businesses. Now we've talked about, or sometimes being acquired, uh, we've talked about um, how you drive this down into a, um, into s contractors and subcontractors. But what about if, you, if you've got a, you know, a merger or a takeover? How do you then, and you've got two different cultures, how do you best, to get the best of both rather than the lowest common denominator? Yeah, I think whenever there's those big changes in an organisation, you know, you go into a new geography or as you say, you acquire or you are acquired, um, you know, even, you know, if you're like in a downsizing um, frame, those big changes and disruptions really do change the safety dynamic. So it's a time when more vigilance is needed. And when you think about the project plans that get put in place for these things, there's not necessarily always a sort of safety moment at the start of it to say, well, what might the outcomes be? I think in organisations, you know, that are the big hazards, um, mining companies, um, you know, airlines, these sorts of things, probably a much greater propensity to think that through. Uh, but I, I don't think we take enough um, heed to change. Um, even holidays, um, you know, we ran quite a big um, campaign through Safe Work and the regulators at uh, holiday time to sort of people are in a different mode, um, and so you know their you know headspace might be quite different. Um, so I think this is the thing: is recognising that safety always needs to be given that number one um, uh, ranking that Marcus was talking about. Mm. I think also it's asking the questions. So I in any situation where two companies are coming together. Um, it's dangerous to presume anything. So I think you need to understand what the culture is, of, of, what the cultures are of the two organisations. Um, if there's nothing wrong with it right now, then there's a, a good period to understand about how you can get the best out of both and, and how you can end up with the best outcome. If there's some, something fundamentally flawed with the organisation and they are entering people at rate of knots and their systems are failing, then there's you know, quite a, a triage that needs to go on. You need to get in there and, and almost have that immediate change. So. I don't think there's one answer to it, um, but it's asking questions, understanding you know, what the history is, what the culture is, um, and what needs to change. Mm. And if it's starting off at a high base, then, then you merge slowly, you change slowly. If it's a low base, then you get in actively and, and drive change quickly. If you go back to the, to the start, when the acquisition or the merger uh, is being contemplated, uh, boards put a huge amount of effort into really understanding the, the cultures of the two of the two organisations, because that's the that's the that's the hard part. Um, it may well be a strategic fit, 
but if the culture isn't right, then it's, it, the, the challenges are much greater. Might still be achievable, might still be the right thing for the company to do. Uh, but And when we talk about culture, safety culture is the easiest and best way to get a feel for what's really going on in the place. So uh, that due diligence is a pretty critical yeah. part. And I have seen screening um, for acquisition targets by mm. companies that are serial acquirers. It has the safety culture and the safety outcomes as a question in the screen. You know, and a, a evaluation at the beginning whether that company can actually fit into the environment. So mm. it certainly can be quite a prominent decision and, tool. And, if it, and do you think if it's regarded as not a good fit, does that um, often rule it out? Or do people just say we're going to actually have to impose our different standards? I think it can be culture. used as a, definitely a rule out. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly if there's an ability to improve, then it's a positive synergy for the acquiring company to be able to put their systems and processes through. But it certainly can be used as a reject in the screen. And if you were looking at a couple of companies and you know one had a very bad set of safety outcomes and the other one had a good safety outcome and another reason they were pretty much similar, you know where you'd be jumping. Mm. And, and, and what the board would expect to see if it were to proceed uh, with challenges is how are those challenges going to be dealt with? You know, a really clear plan for uh, tackling uh, what might be, a, you know, a, a, a difficulty. Yeah. And you'll see a lot of this when you do the litigation review, mm -hmm. you know, so you look back into the company's history and see what their workers' compensation history has been and whether they've got any, you know, large matters that have got a safety flavour to them. So it definitely Mar comes Marcus into that Marcus will be screen. saying, though, you have to get out there and, and get into it and find the place. You find we, out what it's like on, the, on well. the ground. Which is, is that right? The, yeah, so we've yeah. we've recently acquired a, a business, so we've gone from having seven print sites and now having uh, ten. Um, and we've conduct, we're getting an independent order conducted to do exactly that, go around these are the behaviours we've established we want in our business, um, so let's do, go and test the behaviours in that business to see if they meet our standards. These are systems and processes we expect, so let's test to see whether um, you know, the, the sites we've acquired um, stand up with that because it's safety can also be something that's very easy to get a nice bit of paper and put it across the table and say, well, aren't we good? But until you go and ask the questions and test you know, what's actually happening, um, that paper might not actually flow down to the organisation and, and to everyone that's, that's out there working. Mm. So the specific we've done is just conduct an independent audit to see where they are and what we need to do. And in terms of, uh, of such an audit, again, it's, it's much easier to measure specific things like, uh, you know, the rate of, of, of injury or, or even possibly, you know, time off work for illness reasons. Um, but we're now talking about uh, a much a changing world where there's a lot of um, uh, periods at work where you're actually never off when you, you know that 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 line between work and being at home and private life is increasingly blurred so how do you uh, accommodate for that and we talked a little bit about you know the new frontier but is it, this is increasingly an issue how and how do you measure that type of issue that's a very hard question. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> I think if, if I could answer that now, then you know, there's probably a, a prize in there for me as well. Um, <laughs> well I'm it, sure we can find one. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> look, it's a constant challenge because we're, we're expected to be um, responsive 24-7. Um, um, we put a lot more on our leaders. Um, we put a lot more on our frontline operators. So a lot of what I'm trying to design in our organisation at the moment is um, moving a lot more towards self-managed teams and having fewer leaders to, to lead those teams. Um, so it, by design, when you do that, you put a greater expectation on those fewer leaders to be you know, accountable for longer periods of time. So it's, it, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, and the, the conversation you have is to make sure when you go on holiday, you, you, know, you do switch off, or when you're away for weekends, you do switch off. And that's leading by example. So you know, I'm actually going on holiday tomorrow, phone's off, um, out of office is on. Um, and hope that lasts for two weeks while I'm away. But um, I've it, never managed it so far. No, look, and I'll, I'll tell you in two weeks' time whether it worked or not. But it, it's, it's trying to lead that by example. Um, but it's getting harder and harder because the business does expect you to respond constantly. Um, I'm not really sure we've got that right yet. What, what do you think, Diane? Well, we know that workplace place flexibility is really important um, in being able to engage employees. But when you think about, you know, the style of workplace flexibility that I might want might be quite different to what you want, quite different, you know, to what the guys want. So how do you manage in that environment as well? I think it brings in a whole lot of new challenges 
and certainly a lot more handoffs. And we know that you know in process engineering world, the handoff is the thing that we want to get rid of. You know, we want to have fewer handoffs because whenever there's a handoff, can you, you know, explain what a handoff is? Uh, so a handoff is if I've got a piece of the process. Um, I finish my piece and to get the rest of the task done I need to hand it to Dean. So I hand it off to Dean. Um, and the way that that occurs, you know, you can have slippage. Um, my communication of what's going on may be less than, um, you know, perfect and, and so there's always some a danger that comes into that either from getting a, a bad safety outcome but just a bad process outcome. Um, and when you think about workplace flexibility and also the fractionation of work, you know, so as we have more automation, the amount of work that needs to be done by a person may shrink. So some of our jobs may no longer be full-time jobs. So I think this is a new arena that we're coming into that we haven't yet thought through all of the risks and the hazards and what the implications are going to be for safety outcomes. Now, there's lots of industries, of course, that have been handing, handling this sort of stuff all the time. You know, when people say to me, oh, it's difficult to job share, I say, well, how do you think you know, emergency surgeons and ICU surgeons handle this sort of stuff. You know, they can't work until the patient gets better without a break. So at some point they have to hand off. So I think there's lessons in other industries we can use, but we're in early days, infant days on this topic. Mm. The other change that's occurring, obviously, in the workplace uh, is the fact that people are tending to work longer. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the idea that you'd retire at 55 seems to have completely uh, vanished uh, for certainly uh, a what huge... What do you think about that? <laughs> ...number of the workplace. So, so how, hmm. how, does that, how does that affect safety? It, I mean, obviously, I suppose you can say it, it's clearly more of a factor in a, uh, w where there's physical more effort physical required. More physical activity, yeah. like um, mining But what about, or what about, you know, just even if you're doing screen work, how, how do companies deal with that? You asking me? I am asking you. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of us are retiring at fifty-five. No, no, no. <laughs> that's way in the past. No, no. Well, uh, I mean, clearly, uh, I think the, um, the, the my instant response is to think about the responsibility of the individual, mm -hmm. and if you expect to work longer, then I think you have to be prepared to uh, perform. And this question of fitness for work uh, is something that is clearly in, in your court as well as for the organisation. The organisation will create a culture in which you are encouraged, supported, um, helped financially even with health programs and, and so on, but it's up to the... I look really hard at the individual. If, if, uh, if you want to work, I think you, you've got to be absolutely sure you present yourself in the right, uh, in the right place and are able to make the contribution that's expected of you. And Marcus, do you see that as part of what you're talking about, having a more engaged workforce that also takes responsibility for themselves as well as being encouraged to do that by the company? It is. I mean, there's, there's a large education piece there where as you know, the workforce contracts and, and people uh, are working harder, um, there are more strains on individuals, or can be more strains on individuals, so they need to be aware of, of how they present for work. Um, and that is, you know, stepping back to what we spoke about about half an hour ago, um, that's a conversation that leaders need to have. And I think as Diane touched on, it's, it's quite hard to, to start a conversation with someone saying um, your, your weight might be a challenge for your job um, or it's posing health risks for you, which might have consequences outside of work. Um, but that's a kind of a, a conversation you have with someone you respect as well. Um, because it, to me, a lot of this is, is around how you care for your people. And if you truly care for your people, then you are going to be having conversations about what's best for them or what or pointing out information that might be best for them. Whether they choose to, to act on that information um, is, is, is the next challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm conscious of the fact that we, uh, we're trying to allow some time for questions from the audience. So if there's anybody who's got a question, please raise your hand and uh, I'll be happy to take it. The lady at the back there. There's a microphone, and please just say where you're from. Yes, Liz Greenwood from the New South Wales Business Chamber. Um, the question I have relates to the new frontier of well-being, physical, mental, and general well-being. Uh, you mentioned um, programs where, for example, the physio in the morning and, and people are encouraged to talk about um, themselves and, and their wellness. Um, but I guess the question then is, what then happens with that information? You know, it's, it's 
do you ever come across a situation where employees sit down and, and they relax and they talk about their issues and then perhaps afterwards think, oh gosh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. And I suppose what, what do you do as employers to, to help make that discussion happen so that there are no ramifications or perceived ramifications for having that full and frank discussion? Diane. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And I think this is but something that's been in workplaces forever. You know, we can all think of settings where sometimes the office holiday party, you know, where behaviour will occur that, um, you know, may people feel a bit embarrassed about afterwards. And so it's, it's got a very strong analogue with that type of behaviour. So how do you have a good holiday party, you know, is probably going to tell you how you have a good courageous conversation. We've talked a lot about frameworks and, you know, equipping individual team leaders and managers with the skills that they need to be able to have those conversations without causing damage in the organisation. Because, um, you know, poorly planned and executed, you know, interventions of that nature into wellness and so forth can be just as damaging and risky at work as, you know, a sort of unsafe practice in another area. So I don't think there's an easy answer but I do think there's quite a lot of resources available to illuminate that, particularly for smaller businesses that might not have the resources to have the conversation in the way that big business does. But I think it's an evolving space. Um, we're probably a six out of 10 in this country at the moment. We need to do better. There's a good example, if I may, uh, one of the a parallel industry to, to mine. Um, Safety Week, a couple of years ago, they did a survey of their staff and they had a, a free medical checkup. And one of the bits of feedback came that about 60% of the workforce was um, overweight to obese and they had some cardiovascular issues. So they approached the site, they approached the union that represented the site and together the management union um, went out to the floor and they started the biggest loser board. Um, where anyone who wanted to could go up there and put their weight on the board and then you know, put their goals. And as a site, they then encouraged each other to lose weight. And generally across the site, they lost some substantial weight. Um, so they used something that was a bit fun to address a serious issue and, and, and got a good result. So I think depending on what the issue you're confronting is, um, you just got to be prepared to confront it. Katie? Uh, thank you, panel, for a very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, Katie Leahy from Star Entertainment Group. I'd just like to, you to tell us a little bit more about the role of the unions in health uh, work safety. Dean. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very interesting question. You ask a, a person who grew up in construction, building and engineering as a civil engineer and contractor for a long time uh, and has been involved as a non-executive director with quite a few companies in um, highly unionised areas as well. Um, I just wish it was much better. Uh, it's pretty tough. Uh, unfortunately, safety is a bargaining tool rather than a focus for, Im for real improvement. Um, and uh, I think we, uh, in this country, we have a huge opportunity to bring about a, um, a place where unions take a different role with respect to building safety cultures than they do at present. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I, I might say that I'm pleased that I'm not directly involved in it anymore. Diane? Well, you know, I, I think that Dean is right in saying that the role that unions and employers together, you know, the way they've parceled out that set of responsibilities is probably not in an optimum place. But clearly unions have to have a role vis-a-vis -vis safety. They're the representatives of the workers, so it would be crazy to think they're not going to be intimately interested in this topic. But I think we have, through a bit of lack of intestinal fortitude on both sides, sort of ended up with um, safety becoming involved in bargaining. And it shouldn't be. It should be completely separated over to one side. And I certainly believe that unions could take a role in safety training, um, as long as those organisations are very much arm's length and you know have the right sort of expertise. There's no reason why that shouldn't occur. So, uh, you know, many people will know I'm a bit of a windmill tilter, you know, I haven't found a windmill, I don't want to hop on my horse with my sword and have a bit of a joust at. So I do think we could try to step towards a much different sort of arrangement 
and I think it's open, it's partnering, and it's about trying to drive towards the outcomes. Um, but suggesting there's no role is clearly not an option, and I don't think that's what Katie was suggesting either. I think she was just asking what's the yeah. right role. Yeah. And I think we might have time for one last question down here. Hi, um, I'm Steph D'Souza from Thomson Reuters. Uh, a Safe Work Australia study last year indicated that women suffered more bullying in the workplace than other demographics, so that was unwanted sexual behaviour, unfair treatment due to their gender or even physical threats. What can big businesses do to lead and protect the health and safety of those workers, but anybody who's bullied in the workplace? Yeah, look, I think you said the important thing right at the end of your question there, everyone needs to have a safe workplace that's free from bullying and any sort of violence. And so, you know, business doesn't discriminate in that way. Why more women than men? I think this is really an artefact of the fact that we don't have gender equity in our workplaces. So 46% of the Australian workforce is female, but only 10% of leadership positions in large companies. So it does create a different dynamic. I think that's what's at play. Fix the root cause of gender equity and participation. Fast forward 25 or 30 years, sorry, it's gonna take that long. This won't be a topic. But it's also zero tolerance. So, it, but it's, it, I, I think I agree with Diane, it's zero tolerance against all incorrect behavior. So. I think as, as soon as the leadership team allows the, the wrong behaviours to creep into organisation, um, then, then the doors open up to all the wrong behaviours. So as soon as you, you are very blunt that you know, th these are our standards and we're not going to let them slip, uh, and whether that's bullying and harassment against anyone in the organisation, then, then there's, you remove the problem. So I think we, they're being much firmer on your standards is, is, is the key thing. Now we're just going to squeeze in one last question. Nina Pakrich, Work Health and Safety Consultant. As a Work Health and Safety Consultant for a, working for a large organisation, my biggest barrier to improving safety is the lack of ready access to dollars. I always have to go with cap in hand to middle management for safety improvements. Keeping that in mind, how would you react to a proposal to link CEO or director bonuses to an improvement in agreed safety KPIs and not just to increase in profits? Dean? Well, they already are. Uh, with most, uh, most CEOs, in my experience, uh, an essential part of their KPIs for short-term bonuses uh, is safety performance. And often it's a mixture of um, lag indicator and lead indicator uh, to try and get, you know, balance the, the focus. But that's a very big part of, um, um, of the bonus assessment for, I would say, all big business uh, across the board. Yeah, the conversation that I'm often part of is, should safety be a modifier to the overall incentive scheme, however that operates, or is it one of the parts of that scheme? And I think companies have a big conversation with themselves about that particular factor, and that's an important one, because the idea of paying for safety doesn't sit well and, and in all the sort of conversation we've been having so far. And so I think people are very interested in this idea of modifying outcomes and then how do you determine you know, how that should actually work because how you get the outcomes is as important as the outcomes you get. Well, we're coming to the end of our discussion. I'd just like to finish it off by um, asking each of the panellists what's the biggest change they expect to see uh, in, in five years' time if we're talking about safety and culture? I think we, we touched on it a bit before, which is, is the whole mental health issue and, and how we support people from that aspect. Um, it, whether it's, a, it's always been there and we haven't understood it or whether it's, it's you know, some of the society pressures we're now getting around that constantly um, accessible 24-7, um, I think that's, to me, that's the frontier that we need to understand more and really um, provide you know, good networks to support mental health. So I, I, I'd hope in five years' time, um, you know, organisations have a much better handle on how they're going to look after people from a mental angle, um, how they're going to have processes in place to support them, um, and how they are going to let people switch off. Because I think um, the point you raised before about people um, you know, being there 24-7 and you, you, know, you haven't had, had the break when you go and leave, you know, that's the bit we've got to get right. So we do support people um, mentally. Dean? Uh, I'd like to see all the stakeholders a bit better aligned uh, with what we're trying to do in safety. I mean, the 
the opportunity with the unions we've raised in, uh, via a question, but with our shareholders um, and uh, the the various activists, um, the other stakeholders in, in, in our business, clearly we engage a lot with our employees, but to see all of the stakeholders much better aligned and being able to value this kind of contra the, the things we've been talking about today, they make a real contribution to everybody's lives if, if done well. So if we could all get get aligned there, uh, and hopefully that's uh, that that would be an aspiration for the next five years for me. Diane, I'm hoping for data analytics to play a big role, so that the wealth of information that we've got about safety outcomes and about hazards is more, you know, penetrable, so that we can use it to really guide decision making, and we can use it to guide design in systems, so that safety outcomes get better. Okay, well, I think it's been uh, an absolutely fascinating discussion and uh, I'd appreciate uh, you all joining me in the studio audience at least uh, in uh, showing your appreciation. Thank you very much to the panel. <laughs>